This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel, broadcasting remotely. Before the U.S. Capitol was breached, some extremist groups have been organizing on the most common social media apps. Today, where we live, we talk about how the Internet is used to amplify false information and incite violence. Extremists had a home on the web long before the existence of Parler, an alternative social media network which has been booted off big tech platforms in the wake of the January 6th riots. Content moderation has only been used sporadically across the most popular social media, like Facebook and Twitter. How should tech companies make sure their platforms are safe and moderated fairly, especially as extremists migrate from one platform to the next? You can join our conversation, 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WMPR. Or you can share a comment on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. My first guest today on Zoom is Christina Lopez, a senior research analyst at Data and Society, an independent nonprofit research institute. Christina, welcome to the show. Pleasure to be here. Now, your institute does a lot of research, including into how different groups use the Internet to destabilize institutions in our society. A lot of attention on Parler and what former President Donald Trump has said using social media. But we know that extremism has existed online for some time, especially on the fringes. And then there's been a change over the last uh, few years. Can you describe uh, where extremism um, has lived and how it has changed? Well, that's absolutely correct. We have to be clear that extremism didn't really, wasn't really new to the internet. It just has changed the ways in which it travels from the fringes into the mainstream. What we have seen uh, increasingly accelerating, I would say, in the past couple of years has been the mainstreamification of what used to be considered a lot of extreme ideas. So earlier in the social media days, you used to be able to find the sort of um, non-mainstream or extreme racist ideas in the fringes of anonymous message boards. With their anonymity, they allowed anyone to be able to participate and put out their increasingly radical ideas. And these sites, um, which were anonymous message boards, were incredibly important to escalate the rhetoric. And so you have these anonymous message boards um, back in the days, the most popular one was 4chan, um, and together with 8chan, they housed a lot of this extreme rhetoric, a lot of this extremist agenda, and kind of set the topic of conversation on the web. But these, these websites, at the end of the day, did not allow for a lot of organizing because their anonymity, which was something that really privileged at the beginning it's used because a lot of people would flock there for, for that anonymity. That didn't let folks reach and, and meet people in real life. And so that's when you start seeing that this rhetoric starts becoming you know, more normal and what you could, would consider mainstream so, social media apps. And you start seeing increasingly more extremist activity in, in Facebook and Twitter. And that's how from the fringes, suddenly you start seeing a lot of language that used to only belong to anonymous message boards start inf infiltrating the rhetoric in the mainstream social media apps. And suddenly you start seeing it too from elected officials and from users that have verification. So the times of where anonymity was the main, the main attraction in certain platforms stops being so attractive and reach becomes more important for extremism. Reach and, and reaching new audiences too. And so it was when extremist rhetoric started becoming more mainstream where organization and coordination and event planning started happening across the board. And that slow trickling of, the, of extremism into, main, into the mainstream platforms is in large part what allowed something like January 6th to, to normalize and, and manifest in real life. Mm -hmm. When you talk about some of these extreme ideas and conversations becoming more mainstream, can you give us a timeline on, on when that became more apparent? I would say that it's very easy to look at, extreme, at the problem of extremism and not talk about what was going on on YouTube for the last for the most part, while 
in anonymous message boards, you had, you know, constant rhetoric escalation and kind of the setting of the agenda. You started also seeing around 2015, 2016, the escalation of this rhetoric on YouTube. And YouTube was incredibly effective at allowing um, what I'm going to call extremist influencers to be able to create their own audiences and channels and in that sense, take hold of a lot of the extremist rhetoric and, and kind of mainstream it and provide, you know, new language for things that we, what we call radicalization, they were calling red pilling and increasingly um, language that doesn't sound that radical for things that were incredibly extreme. So you have this it, it, on YouTube, YouTube becomes an incredibly effective platform for outreach, for reaching into uh, unsuspecting audiences that perhaps weren't even that political themselves. And this also had some presence on, on Facebook because you have influencers who want to expand their reach across audiences. And a good way of doing that is by also entering other platforms and, you know, starting Facebook groups and populating hashtags that are common. And so I would say that in increasingly for at least the far right, 2016 and 2017 were years of massive growth within mainstream media. And what that meant too, is that extremists were no longer, you know, on the fringes of both the internet and society. Increasingly, um, it was mainstream folk who were just more familiar to these ideas and these ideas had become normalized and more common. And when everyone in the social media platform that you usually get your content from, when when the rhetoric kind of is, is ex, it's extreme all around, you don't consider yourself extreme. You consider yourself pretty average. I'm glad you brought up YouTube, Christina, because I know when we think about Twitter, which has been around for a while, uh, a lot of journalists use it, definitely popular among a certain demographic, but young people are the ones on YouTube. And when we think about influencers and how they're reaching uh, people uh, that may not be on what we think of as Twitter or Facebook, I mean, that's important too when they're amplifying this message and their message being seen as more legit than they would in maybe a traditional sense. Right, correct. In, in YouTube, what happened it was a boon for influencers. I would say that it was their ability to present ideas that were old extremist ideas. Cause again, these ideas are not new to American society. Their packaging and the rhetoric that is used to advance them is what, what mostly changed. It also changed in the sense that those who were spousing this rhetoric were no longer, you know, folks, uh, wearing the KKK robes. It was increasingly relatable folks, increasingly, you know, mainstream average, what you would consider average America. And it, on YouTube, they found that they could reach, you know, a number of different audiences of different ages. And you also have um, Facebook that becomes a very quick vehicle for, um, for, for, for the reach of radicalization in the sense that through Facebook, folks were able to just see who in their community and their actual geographical uh, close community, who in their community kind of spouse the same types of ideas. You start seeing the ability of uh, coordinate at the local level of reaching, of meeting new people with uh, like-minded ideas, of, of starting to also anchor what had been originally, you know, a, a rhetorical movement on the fringes, you start organizing around also the, the social lives of folks, because now it, 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 it brought a local perspective to what used to be, you know, the extremist rhetoric on the internet started taking hold within folks, like actual social, like physical networks. Mm -hmm. and, and now you had, you know, for conspiracy theorists, you had a local chapters of QAnon like that lived in different um, areas of, of Facebook that that also had kind of a, a geographical equivalent. And, and, and this was organizing. And this is the sort of organizing that allows ideas to become movements.
You're hearing Christina Lopez here on Where We Live. She's Senior Research Analyst at Data and Society. This is an independent nonprofit research institute. As we look at how the Internet has been used to amplify false information and incite violence, looking at January 6th, uh, now that we have uh, rules, uh, again, that have been on social media for some time, Facebook and Twitter, what should be the role of these, uh, these companies in regulating or moderating the content that's being shared? You can join us. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. And so when we think about how ideas become mainstream, can you walk us through, well, some people might say, well, this sounds really ridiculous. How did this be able, how was this able to take root when we think about QAnon uh, as an example? Can you describe how messages are amplified, the ways that these groups have been able to do this successfully? Well, there's an, a different number of techniques that allowed them to go from obscurity to mainstreamification. And a couple of those are innately media manipulation. Some of the ways that they were able to reach more people were by exploiting the same mechanisms that social media platforms uh, put as part of the design for the platforms. The affordances, they include that, that let folks connect to you know, the, their, their old coworkers or let folks like find people that's, that think similarly, those affordances and those, that sort of design became exploited to advance uh, ideas that are a lot more radical. Some of these, you know, techniques would include um, seeing which hashtag was, was very popular and kind of hijacking it for the purpose of repurposing the, the rhetoric into something a lot more extreme. There was a lot of uh, coverage back in, 2016 and 2017 that focused a lot on how powerful memes had been for the far right to normalize ideas and kind of turn ideas that sounded really scary and incredibly extreme into this sort of irony or ironic joke that allowed the, a lot of them um, this veneer of irony that protected them from actual enforcement. There was for the longest time this two-step done that was that advanced radical rhetoric, but then couched it on, on irony or, or had the, that plausible deniability of claiming to be just joking or just memeing. And so these sort of techniques were able to put this sort of content kind of at the centerfold. The other issue that we have too is that on social media platforms, one of the ways that, that things become viral or that ideas reach completely different audiences is through the algorithmic boost that they receive. When certain content is getting a lot of engagement or a lot of views, a lot of shares, a lot of reactions, um, platforms usually give that a boost because it means that this content is do it, doing well. This content is likely to also get a lot of engagement from other folks. And that is how you start seeing some content that would have never left the fringes start becoming incredibly viral. and reaching sometimes unsuspecting folks who perhaps had no idea how some of these ideas were at, at, at the basis was awful racism and xenophobia. Hmm. A lot of attention again on the fact that Parler has been booted off uh, platforms and uh, they are now uh, trying to figure out, uh, they're kind of, I guess, in, in some sense in the, on the fringes again, where they're on uh, figuring out where a platform that could maybe reach as many Americans as they were when Amazon was hosting them and they were able to be downloaded um, in the app stores, Christina. But this effort to ban content there's been efforts to do that before what we saw um, last month. Can you talk about that and, and why, when we think about content moderation, that companies have stepped forward now to say en enough is enough in this particular instance? Part of the issue was that while there has always been um, at least some rules, there have, has always been some some level of content moderation that is innate to platforms. There have always been, you know, community guidelines that kind of limit what types of content can be there. And, and you understand it from the platform perspective, these are things you should have in your product so that the product is safe for use for all of the users so that there no users feel unsafe there so that your product doesn't become the tool that gets used for, you know, bigger crimes. And so, from the beginning, you've had the existence of, of rules that sort of limit what, what flies on the platform and, does, and what doesn't. What you've had too is 
gigantic gaps in inconsistent enforcement and completely different standards for moderation. And some of that comes from uh, political reason reasons. And some of that comes from not giving the moderation the importance in terms of resource management, not giving moderation the importance that it should have in a product like a social media platform. So very often what a lot of researchers in the disinformation field would hear from platforms was that they had moderators and that simply like the, the there was just too much overwhelming content. And this became a reality increasingly with the COVID pandemic. You had suddenly platforms who had outsourced their moderation, had folks who couldn't come to the office to moderate content. And therefore a lot of uh, content fell by the wayside or you had uh, with the COVID pandemic, uh, also a disinformation pandemic that was just going viral all over social media platforms. This is often like cited as one of the reasons why in terms of prioritization, a lot of platforms kind of left a lot of extremism slide. And a third reason for why, yes, content moderation is a role that platforms absolutely need to play for, even for the security of their own brands, this didn't happen consistently. And one of the reasons is because at the very top of the chain of, of this information and racist content production, you had the, the United States very own president. And so when you insert that gigantic exception to what is a philosophy for enforcement or what should be like a consistent policy uh, of enforcement, that makes it really hard to enforce at every single level. That makes it really hard to scale when you introduce that kind of exception. And the, and the reality is that for four years, there was one account on the internet to whom none of the rules applied. And it was couched on the newsworthiness of what the president of the United States puts out in the world for as, as content, as online content for folks to see, has an innate level of newsworthiness. And because of that, they that was the justification for not enforcing what should have been consistent community guidelines and content policies and so what you got was this normalization of rhetoric was this um mainstreamification of of posting in a way that was not what platforms probably envisioned um their the rhetoric to be and to a huge degree that is what allowed for a lot of far right and and now in general for the mainstream right to attack any sort of moderation or any sort of content decision from the side of platforms as a censorship and this framing of censorship this this playing gaming the refs if you will <laughs> is what has made it really steep for platforms now to to try to enforce the rules that they always had to try to do the job that they just have been really incompetent at doing now is really difficult from a political perspective because this framing of 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 how censors any sort of of content moderation um can be framed as censorship this this has made it really steep for them to do their jobs. We'll talk more about that after a short break. I'm speaking with Christina Lopez, Senior Research Analyst at Data and Society. Coming up, we'll hear more from her about what needs to happen online to curb disinformation. You can join us too. Find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. 
This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today we're talking about how extremists have used the Internet and social media networks to spread disinformation and incite violence, most recently during the January 6th Capitol riots. There are calls for the tech industry to adopt and enforce stricter rules that limit the spread of disinformation. And there's pressure on policymakers to regulate tech companies. But will that happen? Parler may now be offline, but extremists can and have already moved to smaller platforms. With me on Zoom is Christina Lopez, Senior Research Analyst at Data and Society. Before the break, Christina, you talked about rhetoric and how it's been amplified. The example, uh, looking at the former uh, president, uh, I'm thinking of the hashtag Stop the Steal and how that became mainstream. More and more people uh, believing uh, this uh, was, um, you know, again, uh, the claims by the former president that the election was stolen. You also brought up censorship. And I'm wondering, um, again, if you could respond to people who they who say free speech covers those individuals who participated and promoted these riots online. Absolutely. Free speech definitely covers everyone. The issue is who can you demand to guarantee everybody's free speech? Should privates be obligated to just provide for everybody's ability to say whatever they want? And part of the issue, too, is that in this framing, in this completely insidious framing of and what I think is a perversion of what the First Amendment really stands for, um, of trying to couch any effort to moderate rhetoric as censorship is really disingenuous because at the end of the day, like the First Amendment really forces governmental power to not limit anyone's free speech. But it is not as clear or not as certain that it also obligates privates to provide everyone with a soapbox. And that's part of the issue here. It's been, there's sort of been this perversion of what the First Amendment stands for in trying to assert that it also covers people's ability to be amplified. Of course, everyone has the right to say whatever they want, but that right does not include someone else's obligation to provide a platform and amplification strategy through algorithms, um, a megaphone. This is the equivalent of saying that not only privates should allow you to say whatever you want, no matter the consequences and no matter you know the, the violent repercussions of, of that sort of speech, but also insisting that anything you say um, cannot have the consequence of someone taking away your soapbox, of someone taking away your megaphone, because this is effectively what it means to to say whatever you want on social media. It means that you're saying whatever you want, but you also are having access to the ability of amplifying it in ways that socially we couldn't before. That sort of power has had has to come with some level of responsibility. And that is somehow missing in in the discussion when you try to couch simple content moderation which is innate to any sort of platform online platform that hosts content um as censorship it complete prevent perversion of, of the first amendment we know eventually uh, former president trump was kicked off twitter and facebook again a parlor offline after amazon refused to continue hosting parlor um, you can't find it in uh, traditional app stores so is this the start of how tech companies will handle disinformation in the future or do we need congress to have stronger regulations uh, beyond just putting it all on these tech companies to figure out this is an incredibly complex problem and the sort of tactic of everyone throwing and, and pointing fingers at each other, I think it needs a concerted approach and it needs several different approaches. And yes to regulation, mostly because currently there there is not a lot that limits the power of social media companies. And while a lot of the conversation around the deplatforming of former President Trump um, was centered in whether any one social media company should have that much power. It is also true that in that case, they used that power responsibly. Finally, for the first time, they, they probably limited the rhetoric of someone that had the influence to to move to convene a movement into violence. And so in that sense, 
we can have nuanced conversations. Yes, social media platforms have too much power. In this case, they use that power in a justified manner and should have done so before, perhaps. There's also the conversation about how social media platforms need to take content moderation a lot more seriously. And the fact of the matter is that we have seen that that moderation works. There are some cases in which you know, communities and in, in other social, like smaller communities and, and smaller social media platforms self-moderate with different mechanisms. And you, we have seen at smaller scales, you know, some success. The issue and the question comes with, can you replicate those efforts in a global massive scale? And, and that's where questions of size also become relevant. And, you know, this is, this is the kind of situation where a, a problem has become so, so complex that the solutions to it won't necessarily just come from regulation or just, you know, self uh, improving the, the way that, that platforms self moderate. It, it will have to be um, an approach that comes from a lot of sectors. It has to include, you know, the fields of, of social uh, research. It has to include the field of uh, disinformation researchers who have been seeing this issue grow and metastasize online. And this is also, there's also a, a social component to this. Um, a lot of the folks who participated in, in the riots of January 6th, who stormed the Capitol, who were part of this hashtag and, and, and bought the merchandise that was associated with this event, so many of them were just living internet culture in the same way that other fandoms you know, go to a convention of their, their favorite comic and buy the merchandise. It was internet culture manifesting in the physical space, but it was so bizarre because it was extremist internet culture. It was extremist extremism, what you were seeing, the fandom in this case, it was, um, it was, it was rioters. So, but the issue is that while they are consuming this culture, a lot of them are not aware that this is incredibly extreme that that they are being radicalized that they are being lied to and and that inserts a component that is really difficult to discuss but it's important nevertheless of the radicalization how how can we scale back how is is there a possibility of talking some of these folks back into moderation and and that's that's a very difficult question because as you know radicalization happens at the algorithmic level, it, it, it just has an ability to scale and, and reach in ways that de-radicalization, which is often one-on-one, -on -one, which is often a, a, a very slow and painful process, that doesn't really happen at, at algorithmic levels. And, mm -hmm. and, and that limits a lot the work that, that, that needs to be done. And so the solution to this very complex problem definitely comes from, from every sector. It has to involve every community. We just have a couple of minutes left, Christina, but I have to ask, you know, we're talking about all of this. And meantime, the Department of Homeland Security sent out a bulletin the other week warning Americans about potential violence from domestic extremists this year. So how do you see the internet playing a potential role in this kind of activity? The internet is what is going to allow um, the violence of the future to be perpetrated in the sense that it has become integral, an integral aspect to organizing. It has become an integral aspect to folks' social lives and, and livelihoods. And so in, in the sense that it will also be the driver for a lot of development and, and positive growth, it will also be the driver for uh, events like we saw in the Capitol. And, and it will continue to drive folks into um, into violence that they, they didn't think themselves um, capable of. But when the stakes are, are, have been raised as much as they were by the rhetoric of, of the former president and by an entire media apparatus that was complicit in giving a lot of lies, you know, legitimacy and airtime, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's likely that we're going to continue seeing things that are similar. You, you might have seen some, now some moderation and some enforcement, some bans from social media platforms, but this only drives folks to smaller, more hidden platforms on the fringe. And that means that uh, 
they lose the ability of seeing different thoughts and different opinions. And increasingly, it's going to become like one of uh, my former colleagues said this, uh, an incubator for, for radicalization, these smaller platforms that will largely operate, you know, in the dark without a lot of moderation, without a lot of uh, researchers having access to what is being said there. Christina Lopez, again, is Senior Research Analyst at Data and Society. We'll tweet out links to some of the Institute's most recent reports on media manipulation and disinformation. Christina, would love to have you back. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. This is Where We Live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. We'll be back after a short break. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel broadcasting remotely. A programming note tomorrow, we're talking about broadband access, how to make it fair and equitable for all. And on Wednesday, Connecticut Governor Ned Lamont joins us to answer our questions and yours. We hope you join us. Now, a recent study in the Journal of Civic Information looked at whether public engagement in local government improved when meetings became virtual during the pandemic. One of the study's co-authors joins me now on Zoom, Dr. Jonathan Wharton, Associate Professor of Political Science at Southern Connecticut State University. Hi, Jonathan. Morning, Lucy. How are you? Doing well. So you and co-author Jody Gill at Southern looked at 95 municipalities and how they conducted their budget deliberations last spring. That sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> Actually, it's quite interesting. She reached out to initially 100, all municipalities, I think many people in Connecticut forget we have 169, and we heard back from 95. And of course, we followed up with uh, four towns in particular as case studies. So you were looking at after the COVID-19 hit, how towns were forced to transition those meetings to virtual. Uh, We know that the state's open meeting law was temporarily revised under emergency order. So what did you find? How did that transition look across all of these different municipalities? It truly varied. (laughs) Some of these towns uh, dealt with it differently. And what we were both struck by uh, was the fact that, you know, many of these towns were innovative. Some of them were ahead of others. Others needed to combine pathways of communicating or working together, and then some did already. So I think we forget too easily in Connecticut that uh, we have these separate uh, fiefdoms, for good or for bad, largely because of home rule, certainly. Um, but there's got to be more connectivity and more um, some kind of uh, at least continuity between the towns to make sure that things are consistent when it comes to these meetings. I wanted to uh, hear some more examples of what you and Jody found, but I, I chuckled when I was reading the study, and early on in the pandemic, the town of Vernon had uh, their residents, they voted on a budget proposal. It was, it was like a drive-by vote. Tell me about it. Yeah, they had raised their hands as they drove past because <laughs> um, they wanted some kind of record, at least, from residents in terms of whether they're supportive uh, of an issue. And so that, that's kind of interesting because public participation is an interesting aspect to a lot of these meetings. And that instance in Vernon, uh, that stood out for us. As a matter of fact, that's what kind of sparked uh, Jody's interest uh, initially in this first place, was just how unique Vernon was. So we know that, I know, for uh, running a talk show, we rely on Zoom to connect to guests like you, Jonathan. But uh, a little bit more about how towns uh, were outfitted to make that that switch. Uh, I know, I guess it was Town of Fairfield had been doing online for some time. But in terms of other towns, were there struggles and what were they? Yeah, there were, uh, you know, and, and it was, we were really intrigued by the example in New Haven and Hamden, right? Because one issue that came up over and over again was Zumba. When people would at least get online, they might easily curse or do some kind of, uh, you know, problematic pictures or whatever, and it will be there in the middle of the meeting. And so uh, New Haven was trying to learn, okay, what did Hamden have to do with that in terms of how they addressed it? And what were ways of getting around that? So New Haven at least brought out to us through the mayor and even the chief of staff there uh, for the Board of Alders, how they went about that. Um, They looked at Hamden and other towns in the area in terms of how they addressed it. Um, A lot of it was just trial and error and see what worked for them. So we were really struck by that, that uh, the towns in that instance were at least working together on something like that. How did town officials respond? Did some of the uh, council and other the selectmen, did they like the fact that they were able to be online and, and maybe public participation was greater in their town than before? But were there challenges? Did they feel like it wasn't um, as engaging or the fact that people weren't in front of them literally uh, reading their testimony versus a uh, written comment? You know, we heard it from everyone uh, in so many different ways. Um, you know, some Alders and council members totally respected and understood the need for something like this, even if it were to continue. Others had to find uh, ways of learning and adapting to this. 
Um, and there were concerns, and rightfully so, about how can constituents go about on a platform like this, especially if they don't have access to the internet. Uh, we saw that as an issue over and over again, which is why uh, you know many of the local officials were saying, well, you can call in if you need to. Or in some towns, they required that you have to email comments or statements as opposed to actually talking directly um, at the meetings, which again, poses some challenges because how do you allow a form like this one to take off if you're limiting um, speech in some ways? And making information accessible before meetings online, did that improve, Jonathan, from the municipalities you heard back where you're getting minutes and other proposals available uh, before a meeting actually takes place? Yes, actually, we found some instances where uh, more people did participate because they found uh, different pathways of doing it as opposed to just generally attending a, a regular public meeting. Because I think, Lucy, many people forget there are a lot of reasons why people are not able to attend meetings, right? And conflicts, certainly because of scheduling. Sometimes we discovered at least child care was an issue. Um, you know, there are a number of scholars who pose those challenges in local politics. I know my field tends to be overlooked in political science. I get it. But it's kind of interesting when you hear these same challenges that many constituents face come out. And even if we're doing this online, there's still challenges. So I, I think a lot of this is still kind of an ongoing learning experience for everyone, um, lawmakers, constituents, um, you know, certainly academics like myself and Jody. So overall, of the 95 municipalities you heard back from, did public participation, did it expand in the pandemic, Jonathan? It, it did. Um, in, in some ways, it did. Um, not for every town, not in every instance, but when it came to budgetary concerns, voters still found a pathway of expressing or explaining their concerns. We tend to have seen that more uh, explicit. It, it was kind of interesting, not so much in March, right? Because of course we were transitioning, but more so towards the end of the process, maybe towards May and June especially, because of course the budget season has to kind of wrap up by then for many of these towns. And then when we think about uh, the information that you and Jody gathered, what are some recommendations for towns moving forward? We're all hoping what this pandemic will end uh, sooner rather than later, but in terms of seeing that public engagement maybe growing a little bit, uh, is there pl are there plans to maybe keep that online aspect in some towns? What are you hearing? Yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, we heard some from some officials they'd like to continue some of this. Um, a hybrid might be a model where uh, the meetings might take place. Uh, whether they're online or in person, and yet people can participate whether it is in person or online. So do a little bit of both the best possible. We heard a lot of positive feedback about that uh, from, from some officials. And in some towns like Fairfield, for example, which of course we, we chose to use as a case study, they had already planned around this anyway. And so they want to add to this. One of the recommendations, as you know very well, Lucy, you probably read, was that we really see the need for a lot of these towns to communicate with each other. And we think that among other organizations like the Connecticut Conference of Municipalities, that, that that's a start, right? That they can begin learning best practices and pathways to work with towns with each other. Because let's face it, we need more of that in Connecticut. And, and of course, I think you know now that this is the timing is ripe since the budgetary season is about to begin in many of these towns. And it is kind of interesting, I think, as you know, to see what the state government, certainly the General Assembly, is going to be doing about having these meetings and committee hearings online. Oh, yes, that will be interesting to follow. We think a lot about, uh, you mentioned earlier, not everybody has uh, good internet access. That can be a barrier. But when we think about getting more young people engaged in the political mm -hmm. process, engaged with, you know, it, it does matter to attend and be and participate in your town uh, budget hearings. Uh, did they see any engagement grow among young people? You know, we didn't hear so much about that, although the it was interesting. Some of the lawmakers did make it known that they were concerned that they weren't reaching enough young people. We heard some feedback about that, and they wanted to find pathways getting more young people involved. I think, Lucy, you know, it's no secret that Jody and I have emphasized that for our classes, because even though she teaches her journalism class and I teach my local politics, we require students to attend these meetings. So we've always heard feedback from our students that they want to see younger people participate in these forums. So this could really be a good start. I think many people forget that it tends to be older, retired, uh, people who have more resources and may not work a full-time job who are capable and able to, to go to these meetings in person. I think it'll be interesting to see how this continues uh, with the budget hearings, as you mentioned, just starting up the budget meetings. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Jonathan Wharton, Associate Professor of Political Science at Southern Connecticut State University, for talking about this study. We'll tweet out a link uh, for our listeners who want to learn more. Jonathan, thanks again. Thank you, Lucy. I appreciate it. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today's show produced by Tess Terrible. Our technical producer is Kat Pastor.